February 2016 at the National Museum of Computing at Bletchley Park. In these surviving historic World War II huts, you'll find the Colossus reconstruction and the world's oldest working computer, the Witch. Alongside them, the EDSAC gallery continues to take shape, completing a unique display of early British computing success. Although EDSAC isn't yet running, the museum runs tours of the machine. Now, he didn't want to build something that was overly blindingly fast. He wanted something that was reliable and using known technologies. So this is what we end up with. The EDSAC replica has to be a working machine and the delay storage is an essential component. Difficult and controversial compromises have had to be made in the replica design and Peter Linnington tells the story. The original EDSAC had a main memory constructed using mercury delay lines. But there are a number of good reasons why this isn't a good choice for the replica. Fairly obvious ones are health and safety issues, cost of a quarter of a tonne of mercury, handling difficulties. But there are also problems with running a mercury store in a museum environment because it was a very fussy beast, um, very sensitive to temperature variation, and therefore difficult to keep running in an environment where the temperature is changing. Finally, it's a technology that needs some quite high precision engineering which means we would have had to put more of the work out to specialist manufacturers and have less involvement from the volunteer group. All in all, it seemed more sensible to use a different technology. And the one we chose was the natural successor of Mercury, the nickel wire delay line. This is in very, many ways similar to the Mercury delay line. It's another technology that uses sound waves to delay pulses of information. Both are based on the circulation of pulses around a loop in which the wire or the tube of mercury provide a delay element and electronics is then used to condition the pulse stream and regenerate it, reclock it, and ensure that it doesn't degrade as a result of multiple passes through the loop. This is the smallest unit we use. There are a number of different sizes of store within the machine. There are um, long lines that can act as the main memory, and a number of shorter lines that act as the register storage. This box is an 18-bit register used in the addressing and uh, control functions of the machine. Radio frequency signals come in here, this socket, and pass into a demodulating unit that is tuned to the radio frequency and generates a series of simple pulses that are then fed into this card, which eliminates noise by applying a threshold and then reshapes the pulses into a narrow pulse suitable for driving the delay line. The electrical signal is converted into an acoustic signal in a transducer, which is here. This red plastic carrier carries two small coils, and these coils, driven in an opposite sense, cause a push-pull action on the two nickel tapes passing through them. These tapes are welded onto either side of a nickel wire and generate the torsional pulses that travel down the wire which forms the main delay element. The segment of wire that is the, the heart of the delay line is this piece running from here to here with the nickel tapes attached at either end. So pulses enter here, travel along this wire and exit here to a detector. This second coil then receives the signal um, which is amplified within this screen box here, goes through another pulse shaping phase to get a square pulse out, which then drives an RF modulator and produces an output signal here that goes back to the main machine. This is a short delay line, and so the wire is comparatively short. But for the main store delay lines, the same technology is applied but there are two and a half meters of wire coiled up rather than this little 10 centimeter segment okay. used for a register. We have just moved from a phase of prototyping the short lines 
demonstrating that the technology works in principle, to producing the number that are needed to run the machine. Once that's complete, we will then move on to the much larger boxes that hold uh, 32 integers and these boxes uh, will form the main memory of the machine. Right, the new, the main At today's team meeting, to, Peter brings the volunteers um, up to well, date. Been, last time I took um, possession of a great stack of empty aluminium boxes um, and I've got as far as building and commissioning two of the 18-bit boxes. Peter's had to more or less rediscover the engineering of nickel delay lines. In getting the short delay lines working, he's had to deal with spurious radio frequency signals. I had a problem with RF breakthrough when I first put the units together, um, which I've got rid of, but it's worth mentioning it, I think, because we might have related problems. So this is no input. And this is coming out of two of the test points. That's TP9 going into the clocking stage. That's the clocked output. The interesting thing about this is that this pulse, spurious pulse, doesn't depend on whether or not the store is connected back into the input of the chassis 01. If you unplug the cable that goes back this way into the chassis 01, the breakthrough is still there. So it's internal to the chassis 01 world. Trying to get to investigate it, I had some evidence that it's depended on load. So I put a variable resistor in here and tweaking that, the size of the breakthrough pulse depends on the current that's being drawn into this load. Even though you'd think that this resistance would mess things up because you think of an unbalanced cable, actually reducing the, the total resistive load reduces the, uh, the problem. I then found that sticking a capacitor in to join the box metal work to the braid side of the cable gets rid of the breakthrough anyway. But that's a, that's a sticking plaster rather than a deep piece of theory. And I think it was worth mentioning because if we have similar problems as we change the configuration, it might be worth considering whether there is something in the chassis ones that depends on the current being drawn which is essentially feeding back into the preamp inputs there. So that, that's a kind of a warning for the future. For the 36-bit lines, I've got one made up um, an operational, uh, which runs simple tests, but I only finished it on Tuesday. Um, and at the moment, it's giving me some problems on pattern tests. So we're getting on. We need a population of nine units to run the machine, plus some spares. The original machine had the mercury delay lines in boxes between the racks, known as coffins. The replica will need to look like the original, with the nickel delay lines disguised in boxes with similar dimensions. And this is the kind of thing I have in mind. Again, it's, it's all built out of angle, but this time aluminium angle. This sub-assembly fills one of the bays of the coffin. For the short lines at the end, it fills about a 60% of, of a bay, leaving room for power supplies. It's hoped that the machine will be fully integrated and functioning later this year. This is great. Think about computing today. In one lifetime, we've gone from something I can do this in, I can stand in the computer. So I'm in the CPU, the whole thing, and yet in one lifetime, or less, because some people are now living to that inconvenient age of, what, 110? We've got to computers that can go in you. So think about cochlear implants, pacemakers. The change is outstanding, and it is frightening to think that in this era, a machine running at 650 instructions a second is fast.